I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. I welcome Professor Timothy Snyder of Yale University, whose new book is Black Earth, The Holocaust as History and Warning. This is a thematic masterpiece because it introduces to me, and I've read a deal of this period, a completely fresh understanding of the Holocaust, but also the, the, the destruction of Eastern Europe between the First War and the Second War that becomes the mass murder of the Second War. 1945, 70 years ago, the world had been turned upside down and ripped apart. The numbers are overwhelming. How many died? How many died because of violence directed at unarmed people, let alone all the violence on the battlefield? Professor, a very good evening to you, and congratulations. We begin with... Your quotation from Adolf Hitler. Hitler's reasoning in his own book, My Struggle, Mein Kampf, but then explicated again and again to his audience as he builds a political movement from 1919 until taking the chancellorship in 1933. Hitler writes and says, if the Jew triumphs, quote, then his crown of victory will be the funeral wreath of the human species. What is he talking about? What, what peculiar understanding of the world, of, huma- of humanity, and Judaism is Hitler addressing? Good evening to you. Good evening. I, w- I want to I thank you for the conversation. I want to thank you for beginning with, with Mein Kampf. I think it's, it's very important for us to go back to the sources sometimes, especially when the sources are so important as this one. I think we often tend to think we know what's in Mein Kampf, and, and therefore we don't read it. But what's in Mein Kampf is actually very clear. The passage you cite um, is where Hitler literally says it's them or us. Uh, Either the Jews are going to be destroyed or the human species is going to be destroyed. Note that in that passage, the Jews don't belong to the human species. Uh, We often think that Hitler claims the Jews are are untermenschen, they're subhumans. That's not right. Uh, He thinks the Slavs are subhumans. The Jews are not people. The Jews are some kind of counter race. They're some kind of paranormal creature that have a very special capacity. What is that capacity? Hitler thinks there is a nature out there. There's a real nature under the appearances. And in that real nature, everything is a struggle. He looks at the world of animals and he says, species struggle. And he looks at the world of humans and says, humans are divided up into races. Races struggle. Just like species, all they fundamentally should care about is land and food and reproduction. And the way that Jews fight against that natural order, says Hitler, is that they bring to bear all kinds of ideas. They, the Jews invented, says Hitler, communism, they invented capitalism, they invented Christianity, the rule of law, any idea which draws us away from killing other human beings and taking things from them, any idea of solidarity which is not racial solidarity, any idea of reciprocity which is not racial reciprocity, Hitler says is a Jewish idea. So in Hitler's world, the Jews are taking us away from nature. They're oppressing us without our knowing it by putting all these ideas into circulation, into our minds, into our lives. And the only way to restore ourselves, the only way for the human species to survive, therefore, is to get rid of all these ideas. And Hitler makes it very clear that getting rid of the ideas means getting rid of the Jews, exterminating the Jews. A details here, because they're important as we go through the moments from 33 until 45, Hitler also understands, as the professor says, the Slavs are subhumans, but he does not recognize states. In fact, at one point, you state very clearly, Hitler is not a German nationalist. How did he see the relationship between states as he inherited it in 1933? That's such a great question, because we, we want to reduce Hitler to the categories that are familiar to us. So we want to think, well, he was an authoritarian, but... But, but more so, or he was a nationalist, but more so. But when you look at the text that he left behind, and when you look at his life's work, what you see is something entirely different, both in theory and in practice. What you see is someone who believed that the political order of his day was artificial, was a result of a world which shouldn't exist, was something which had to be swept away by the real struggle, the racial struggle. So from Hitler's point of view, it's not that Germany was good and just needed to be bigger, or that Germans were fine and just needed to be somehow reformed. What Hitler thought was that the German state was good as a tool. The German state could be remade as a kind of hammer of destruction 
which would destroy other states all around it, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and thereby pave the way for the real struggle, the racial struggle, the biological struggle. He behaved like an authoritarian sometimes. He behaved like a nationalist sometimes. But in fact, um, in his own words, he was something very much more like an anarchist, someone who believed that political structures, the ones that existed, should be destroyed, and the new ones that would be set up later on would always be subordinate to the racial struggle, would always be the product of, of the, tri- the racial triumph of the Germans, ne- never a goal in and of themselves. Uh, we, we will follow in the course of this conversation revelations that overturn presumptions about what happened between 33 and 45. For example, and I follow the professor's list, the Holocaust, the Nazis were not the only killers. Many killers were not Nazis. The German Jews mostly did not die at the hands of the German Nazis in Germany. Concentration camps. Most of the dead, almost all the dead, never saw a concentration camp. State power. State power worked where it was in place. It was the statelessness that set the conditions for the mass murder. And science. Timothy, science. What did Hitler make of science, of improving our lives, of the bourgeois' success? So, yeah, this is really important. Hitler, Hitler believed in, 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 in technology. He believed that weapons worked. He believed that um, there should be hygiene. But what he didn't believe in was universal science. What he believed was that um, science has already taught us the only lesson we need to learn. His version of science was um, a kind of social Darwinism where uh, science is just a picture of things. It just tells us something, and that's that one thing, life is a struggle, is all we need to know. So in this way, what he says is that basically science is politics or science is society. There's no difference between science and politics. Science tells us this fundamental truth. What he doesn't acknowledge is that science is, in fact, a process of experimentation, of, of hypotheses and testing, uh, which leads in unexpected dera- directions and which sometimes can change society or change nature or change the relationship between science and nature. This is really important because if science can do things like that, if science can, for example, increase the supply of food, then none of Hitler's theory really makes sense. His entire theory is that we have to begin to struggle. We need a bloody war right away because we need ever more food. Or sometimes we want ever more food. It's all the same to Hitler, need and want. Um, it's good for Hitler if we, if we think we're, we're afraid and we're going to die. It's also good from Hitler's point of view if we simply are envious and want ever more. Either way, it's okay. And either way, if, if we have any hesitations about seizing what we want, um, the ideas, the, the immoral ideas come from Jews. He's... So Hitler also says the scientific ideas come from Jews. If you believe that science can improve your life and therefore you don't have to struggle, that's one more Jewish illusion. He has also constructed what you identify as a logical circle. Man equals beast equals man. And he rejects science because that would, that would break that circle. That would, that would ruin everything for him. Yeah, no, thank you. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to such a careful reader. It, it's, it, it, that's exactly right. I mean, in reality, politics, politics is one thing. And science is something else. Politicians are one kind of person. Scientists are another kind of person. These are spheres of human activity that work according to different rules. And one of the things, it's a very simple point, but I'll make it anyway, one of the things which makes us human is the fact that we can carry out science, right, um, or benefit from it or, under, or understand it. That is one thing which separates us from, from, other, from other species um, on this earth. What Hitler is doing is he's saying that we are, in fact, animals, and it is an illusion to believe otherwise. It's a Jewish illusion to believe otherwise. We we should act like we should act like animals, and if we don't, um, that just means we've misunderstood something. So, as you say, there's nothing in politics which shouldn't lead us back to the struggle, um, and and there's nothing out there in the world which is a, which is struggle which should distract us from from the basic idea of politics. It's just one thing. Politics is struggle. Um, and, and nature is struggle. There's really nothing beyond struggle. And once you make that argument, everything looks very coherent. You have a little explanation for anything which happens. But it's also a totalitarian argument because Hitler is the one who stands at the center of all this and tells us how politics fits into nature or how nature fits into politics. Once there's no real politics left, 
no one else has an argument to make. Once there's no real science left, no one can imagine how the world might be different. We all fall into this circle and, and move around and around and around inside it. And if it sounds far-fetched, we should remember that that's what happened. The book is Black Earth, The Holocaust is History and Warning. Timothy Snyder is the author. When we come back, Hitler's opinion of America and Hitler's opinion of the Soviet Union, critical to understand the decisions that are made in the 1930s. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Professor Timothy Snyder's new book is Black Earth, The Holocaust is History and Warning. Hitler's opinion of America was he admired it. He emulated hit, uh, uh, America, although he never traveled there, although he had no real good information. And fantastically, he based his assumptions about America on the reading of books about the American West, cowboy stories written by Carl May. I've not read these books Professor, are they fantastic versions of America? Was May well informed? Is it all gunplay? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it, on the one hand, it's easy to make fun of this. And on the other hand, there's something very serious going on. Carl, Carl May was himself, a, a, he, was a, he was a writer of Westerns who, who himself never traveled to the American West. So I've tried to read these things a couple of times, and I, I just can't because it's not just that they're far-fetched. It's that the man has no handle on the basic realities of you know, of the West of our country. Um, but what he does convey is this general sense of a frontier and an empire and the progress of, you know, pro the progress of, of white people and the, dis and, and the slow destruction of natives. And that's what Hitler sees. So if we get serious about this, um, Hitler was growing up in a world in the 1890s where literature, not just these, not just these Wild West novels, but literature in general, is all about European imperialism. He, like other Europeans of his generation, is growing up at a time when the Americans are uh, are, are, are bringing the, the West to submission and where Germans and Bel Belgians and French and other Europeans are, are subduing Africa. And this is his world. He plays at Cowboys and Indians. He also plays at African colonialism. And he draws a, he draws a basic lesson about, about America, and it's, it's one that we – have to be a little bit concerned with because although we can mock his sources and we're right to do so, some of his insights weren't so far off. He looks at America and he says, okay, this is a kind of colonialism which is still possible in the world. What we can't do, says Hitler, is that we can't build another maritime empire. We can't, we can't go over um, the, the, the oceans because the British control all the sea lanes. We can't undo that. What we can do is what the Americans did, we can push across some landmass. And so when he imagines a, a German colony, he thinks of Europe or Eurasia as a wild east, which corresponds to the American wild west. And he thinks that the way that Germans are going to satisfy their need for ever more, something which he calls Lebensraum, um, is, by, is by building a frontier empire, which resembles what the right. Americans have done. The, the sinister question, which at one point mocks the idea, but at the, the, other time, at the other point you understand where we're going, is who remembers the Red Indians? That's the, Hitler's understanding of how America has swept aside the native population. You can look at the risings of African population against the German colonialists in the late 19th, early 20th century. However, Russia now, there is a myth that Hitler picks up on. It's not special to him. It's shared by Churchill, for example, even Woodrow Wilson. It was early on in the revolution, 1917, 1918 revolution. And it is how Hitler came to understand Russia, Soviet Union, and what the challenge was for his theory of wiping out Jewry. It's called the Judeo-Bolshevik myth. What is it, Timothy? It's so important because this is how Hitler's planetary ideas come down to earth. Hitler says in a general way, the Jews are responsible for the ideas which, which, which rob us of our nature. Where, how, where can that be destroyed? It can be destroyed when it's in the neighborhood. Hitler looks at the Soviet Union and he sees the incorporation of one of these ideas of communism. 
He looks east and he sees fertile territory in Ukraine, which will allow Germany to rebuild itself. And he looks at the Soviet Union and he sees a state which he can perceive as very fragile. And the reason he perceives it as fragile is that he sees it as Jewish. And from his point of view, Jews are strong when they can fight with ideas, but as soon as confronted with force, they or, or, or their works, their states will collapse. So Hitler accepts this idea, which was widespread at the time, as you say, that Jews are communists and communists are Jews. And that becomes one of the elements of his war planning. For him, it all seems to make sense. The world has to be liberated. Germans have to become a world power. The place that this can start is Eastern Europe, because Eastern Europe is dominated by this communist state, which Hitler defines as being Jewish. What's striking is that this isn't all just book learning or fantastic debate. The crisis of the Russian Revolution, after the failure of the uh, the imperial Tsar's uh, proponents, the uh, the so-called whites, after that failure, they fled, the, the ones with money, to France and Germany. And two significant emigres, Max Erwin von Scheubner Richter and Alfred Rosenberg, both of them were early influences on Hitler in the early 1920s as he's speaking. And what did they teach him? What did they enforce, Timothy? So, yeah, you're absolutely right to stress the, the, the catastrophic character of the Russian Revolution from the point of view of the people who were defeated. The Russian Revolution wasn't just some kind of quick victory by, by a few Bolsheviks. It involved a massive civil war, a violence on the scale of the First World War that continued for another another three or four years after that war was over. And the people who fought it um, uh, on the side that was known as the whites, the people who were resisting the Russian Revolution, more and more came to think of what they were doing as, re- as resisting some kind of apocalypse. And they drew from popular anti-Semitism to come up with this idea that Um, The revolution was the end of the world. The revolution was the return of Satan. This was the link between what Orthodox Christians thought and this experience of political catastrophe, which the elites were experiencing, this Judeo-Bolshevik idea. They brought this all together in their propaganda. They drew from um, a fictional a fictional work called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to blame to blame the Jews for this disaster which they experienced themselves personally in which they, they thought had fallen to Russia and then when they immigrate they bring with them their own beliefs their own writings they also bring with them physically copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and this completes Hitler's worldview up to that point. He had been against the Jews, against capitalism. After this point, after 1919, he's also against communism, and he sees communism as the true focal point of the Jewish conspiracy, the one which has taken a kind of a, a kind of uh, a kind of physical form and which can be directly attacked. As the professor underlines, Hitler had no Russian history. He thought in abstractions, and his abstract thinking was to create a racial empire by eliminating the Jews. When we come back. Where did the Holocaust take place? Why is it important to to identify the geography where the mass murder started in 1941? Timothy Snyder's new book is Black Earth, The Holocaust is History and Warning. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Timothy Snyder's new book is Black Earth, The Holocaust is History and Warning. The Holocaust follows a war on Poland. It was a war launched by both Germany and Russia simultaneously. We need to understand how that war happened because it wasn't Hitler's plan. He had another version, and as the professor makes clear throughout this book, Hitler gets history wrong and reads foreign policy wrong all the time and stumbles and errs and then corrects the error with his fantastic version of the world. However, we begin with an understanding of how Poland thought, how Russia thought, and how Germany thought of colonial empires. 
the words here are critical. Poland believed in recolonizing, recolonialism. Hitler believed in recolonializing. Warsaw believed in decolonializing. Let's start with those two first because they require explication. Professor, recolonial, what did Hitler mean by that? So what, I, what I'm trying to do here is, is look at the world, the way that the Nazis and the Polish leadership, and, and we'll talk about the Soviets too, looked at the world, because this is a moment of world history. It's a moment when old empires were falling away, and new empires were, were being formed, and, and, and everyone was thinking at that level, at that planetary level. What the Nazis were thinking was something like this. Empires are totally legitimate. legitimate. Of course, higher people should be ruling over lower people. The way that Hitler reconceptualized this was to think about everyone um, in, in, in racial categories. So higher races should be ruling over lower races. And he brings this thinking to Europe itself. He looks at Ukrainians the same way he looks at Africans. His racism is not like our American racism. It's not all about pigmentation. He looks at the Ukrainians and he sees a colonial people. People can be satisfied with songs on the radio and beads and things like this. People who can be starved to death, overmastered, turned into slaves, and who will still be obedient. That's, that's how he sees the world. It's natural for there to be empires. There should be more empires, but the empires should be racial. The Poles are a little bit more old-fashioned. Um, their own state was built... Uh, as empires collapsed in 1918, they are not really on the side of empires. Their basic category of thinking is is the nation. They believe that nations uh, have been liberated from empires and in the future will be liberated from empires. So when they look at the Soviet Union, they don't see, the Polish leaders don't see some kind of racial state ruled by Jews. They just, they see a multinational empire, which might fall apart, but if it falls apart, it's going to fall apart into nations rather than into races. So you have two pretty different views of the world, which can seem to align. Both Germany and Poland were hostile to the Soviet Union, but they thought about it in in different ways. A couple of events at the close of the First War create the space for the mass murder. One is that Germany first conquers Russia and takes this vast territory turning into vassal vassal states from the Black Sea to the Baltic Sea. One of those is Ukraine. Secondly, when Germany fails in 1918, the conditions of the Versailles Treaty take huge pieces of Prussia and make them Poland. So Poland sees 1918-1919 as a miracle. Germany sees 1918-1919 as a catastrophe. And in Hitler's perversion, it means that the Jews have gambled with Germany's his, uh, her Germany's history, and that's why Germany lost the war. However, understanding now that the Poles were caught between these two imperial powers, very aggressive, Moscow and Stalin, and Berlin and Hitler. Therefore, we watch the six years that Hitler did not launch a global war, but in, instead prepared for it by turning inwardly to deal with the domestic problems. And the professor uh, underlines this by constructing seven innovations that Hitler applied to what is called the Balkan model. That is, you get more butter by conquering people and you need lots of guns. Let's do what we can, Timothy. The party state, that emulates Lenin. In other words, the state is an apparatus that's one man. What about violence? How did he um, how did he apply the what you call the entrepreneurship of violence? So this is this is great because it helps us to see how Hitler was not just an authoritarian. If you're an authoritarian and you manage to take over a state, well, then you create a police state. You suppress liberties. And, of course, Hitler and Nazis did all these things. But that wasn't their main goal. Their main goal, their final end, was not just to monopolize power or to create more state power. Their main goal was to set up Germany as a place which could destroy other states, which, it, which, could, which could create an empire beyond Germany. So normally when we think of 33 to 39, that period, we consider the SS or the camps. We're thinking, aha, these are instruments for keeping Germans in line. The concentration camps, for example, are a zone of innovation. They're a zone where literally the law does not apply. They're a zone where the party punishes people, the Nazi party, not the state. The SS, the SS is not part of the state. It's not even really a paramilitary. It's, it's, a, it's a racial organization that exists side by side with the state, in tension with the state. 
And it can only really fulfill its own goals, ideology, by going beyond Germany and destroying other states. That's what is there for the entire time. So when we think about violence, what we have to imagine is that Hitler was an anarchist. Taking power in a state was a kind of problem for him. He resolved that problem by not destroying Germany, as his ideology you know, in one reading would have demanded, but instead by preparing Germany by way of camps, by way of the SS, to become an instrument to destroy other states, to unleash anarchy on a broader scale. And then in the long run, he thinks that's going to transform the Germans and transform Germany. And yet the transformation of Germany is still not the goal. Remember, we've got a global vision here, and Hitler's driving it while these six years are not the global war he wants. A detail, he creates an apparatus that is hybrid, and that's important to understand this because Heydrich, we all remember him as the head of the SS, the man who ran the Einsatzgruppen, the mass murderers of Eastern Europe. But that was a mixed force. And eventually, if I read this correctly, Timothy, he brings in everyone who carries a gun, the Gestapo, the Kripo, the Orpo. He even drafted the comparable police organizations in other states that they'd conquered. So he was not a uh, uh, Heydrich and then eventually everybody in the SS and the Gestapo, they weren't particular to your background as long as you used the gun to what? They were looking to wipe out the Jews, but also to create this racial empire with gunplay. Yeah, you've, you've captured a couple of really important aspects of all of this. One is that the, the SS is not part of the state, but it penetrates the state, and, that, and that's what I'm calling hybridity. The uh, Himmler, um, who's at the very top of the SS, thinks of the police forces as future, this is his term, racial warriors. If you think of a policeman as a racial warrior, that's something very different. That's someone who is going to disturb or, in fact, destroy an existing order, an existing political institution, legal order, in the name of a racial logic. But the racial logic has nothing to do with politics or law or institutions. It's something entirely different. So in various ways, by way of ideology, by way of recruitment, by way of placing SS officers inside the police they slowly, over the course of 33 to 39, transform police institutions so that many people are, in fact, ready to kill abroad. Of course, the striking thing is even people who are not specially trained, if you get them out of Germany and you bring them abroad, they were strikingly ready to kill Jews and others, more, more ready than Nazis themselves actually expected. And you're right. It's true. Once states were destroyed, then local police forces could become subordinate um, subordinate aspects of this larger racial police empire, and they also played their part in the destruction of Jews. There's the genius discovery for me, Professor. The destruction of states, the production of statelessness, creates the conditions for a lawlessness we call the Holocaust. Was that purposeful? Did they understand, did Hitler understand as he's creating this hybrid organization that it is going to be strongest when the, uh, when the geography is stateless? Yes, I, th I think he did, and it, it, it appears in it actually appears in Mein Kampf. He makes it quite clear that when the racial struggle begins, c conventional or existing political structures are going to be washed away. Mm. And I think it's, it, it helped, this, this insight helps us to understand the behavior of the SS. Um, we, when we think about ideology, the first thing we think of is anti-Semitism. True enough, but. It's not just that the SS officers were anti-Semitic, therefore they killed Jews. There was something more at play here, and that is that many of them really believed in these ideas of racial anarchy. And so for them, it was natural and good to proceed into other people's countries, physically eliminate their elites, declare all the laws null and void, create new concentration camps, and basically establish a new situation where new forms of politics were possible and improvise find new ways of killing Jews in that new situation. So this is why we have trouble when we just try to jump from anti-Semitism to killing. Because, of course, we all know, if we think about it for a second, that just being anti-Semitic isn't enough to generate mass murder. There has to be something else. And that something else, I think, is the actual faith in this ideology and the ability to put this ideology into practice as, as states were destroyed. There was no master plan, first Austria, Czechoslovakia, then Poland, and the Soviet Union. It was a whole series of accidents. But the nature of the ideology is such that accidents aren't such a big problem. If you can find an opportunity to destroy a state, then you learn more. And each state that's destroyed, your learning progresses till you get to 1941 and where the Germans actually find ways to kill Jews in, in huge and in, in atrocious numbers. Finally, the redefinition of war. Our border is blood. When we come back, 
Poland. I'm John Batchelor with Timothy Snyder, Black Earth, the Holocaust's History and Warning. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm speaking with Professor Timothy Snyder. His new book is Black Earth, The Holocaust, His History and Warning. 1935, the death of a very important player in Poland's history, a man, Pilsudski, who was the hero of the miracle of 1918-1919 I mentioned. However, he dies in 1935. And at this point, we need to look at what Poland's policy was towards Germany and towards the Soviet Union. First to understand, Polsudski is still the leader, the messianic, secular leader of Poland, this created state out of the empires of the Habsburgs and the Russian Empire. He signed a non-aggression pact with Stalin in 1932. Why did he do that, Timothy? It, the, the, the Poles had, like many people in the 1920s, optimistic political ideas about how things might be improved. They, they, they believed for a time that Poland would be a great power, that the Soviet Union might fall apart. During the Great Depression um, and during Stalin's first five-year plan, as Stalin uh, the, and the party established very firm control over the Soviet Union, among other things, by collectivizing agriculture and starving millions of people to death, that led Poland to understand Polish leaders to understand that the status quo was probably their best option. So they were willing at that point in 1931 to enter negotiations with the Soviet Union about a non-aggression treaty, which was signed in the summer of, of 1932. This sets off a general Polish policy because they then look to Berlin and try to sign something similar. And their basic approach is going to be that we are going to be neutral vis-a-vis these two powerful states we will not be an ally of either. And the thinking is, if we're not an ally of either, then there can't be a war. That's a little bit misguided, but we can understand where they're coming Right. In from. January of 34, uh, Pilsudski sends his foreign minister, Joseph Beck, to balance with Germany, and they do sign a non-aggression pact. But Hitler had ambitions, and he was already planning a war on the Soviet Union. And he wanted Poland as an ally, as a neutral. How did he vision it when he signed the non-aggression pact, Professor? Yeah, this is so. This is so interesting, and it gets completely left out of the histories of, of of the period. Hitler didn't intend to attack Poland. It's something that he felt like he had to do in 1939. But from his point of view, he had spent five years trying to recruit the Poles to what he saw as a as a common um, and perfectly understandable venture, which was a joint war against the Soviet Union. Hitler, I mean, to the geography is very important, of course. Poland is geographically between Germany and the Soviet Union. So Poland has to play some kind of role, if only as a battlefield or as only as a route through which German armies are going to march. But Hitler, Hitler contemplated two variants. In the first variant, Poland, Poland's army would have fought the Soviet Union. It would have been a kind of army group center, and the Germans would have gone north and south. In the second variant, Poland is a benign neutral that lets Germany march over it, into the Soviet Union. But either way, Hitler took for granted until late 1938, early 1939, that Poland was going to be some kind of ally, um, some kind of partner at least, in this grand venture of destroying the Soviet Union. And he can think this because the Polish leadership is anti-Soviet. He can also think it after 1935 because the Polish leadership is anti-Semitic. The Polish leadership after 1935, after Pilsudski's death, is looking for ways to solve what it considers to be the Jewish problem. It's not thinking along the same lines that Hitler is, but it is talking about the need to get about 90 percent of the Jews out of Poland. Polish leaders are not prisoners to some kind of global ideology like Hitler's. Um, They're not thinking about physically exterminating the Jews. But when Hitler hears those kinds of ideas, the need to get rid of most of the Jews, he can naturally think that the Polish leaders, both on the Jewish question and on the Soviet question, are very close to his own ideas. Palestine. Palestine was not the first idea. Madagascar was, and it can sound fantastic. So just a moment here. There's an enormous enormous amount of detail, and we have to get the, the balance right. There was a theory, and the Zionists did entertain it, although they rejected it, that asking the French Empire to cooperate to transfer the Jews of Poland and those in the border states to Madagascar, and that would have required the cooperation of several empires. 
Uh, this was an idea also that the Poles longed for after 1926, so that there was something of a debate between the Poles who were not Jewish and the Poles who were Jewish to go to Madagascar. That did not happen. Importantly, Hitler heard Madagascar, and he thought about it really, or he thought about it fantastically. The one that was at the center of the Polish politics, I'm amazed to learn, is Palestine, which requires the British Empire to cooperate because it had the mandate after Vladim- after uh, the Versailles Treaty. And this involves the heroes of the rise of Israel. Vladimir Japotinsky of the Irgun, Menachem Begin of the Irgun, uh, Avram Stern of Lehi, and Yitzhak Shamir of the Ergun. All of those players are part of Poland. What? Poland was preparing them to conquer Palestine. Is that how to put this, Timothy? I'm afraid that, yeah, that is, that is, actually, that is actually true. I mean, that's a more dramatic formulation than I use, but that's, 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 it's actually true. And, and, and it all makes sense if you remember that this is still an imperial age. And people are thinking of the rise and fall of empires and the notion of carving out some new state from empires because the empires want to or because the empires are, are, are weakened by a war is, to, is, to, is totally normal in the time and place. So and one also has to remember that in the 1920s and 1930s, both anti-Semites and Zionists are thinking are looking for bits of territory in the globe, which can somehow be a plausible place for for Jews to live, and sometimes those bit, sometimes those plans overlap. I don't mean ideologically, just in the in the simple geographical sense. What Poland is doing it, is is, the, is it demonstrates what we were talking about earlier how it is how the Poles saw themselves as decolonial. So after 1935, you know, when they're talking about the need for massive Jewish uh, immigration from from Poland, they are among other things trying to prepare their way politically by creating some clients who can, as it were, liberate Palestine from the British. They they start funding um, right wing revisionists, and then they start giving them arms. And then by the spring of 1939, which is a very curious time because at that point they become allies of the British, in the spring of 1939, the Poles are actually taking um, leaders of of Irgun, that is to say um, right-wing revisionist Zionists, and training them up um, at Polish military camps in the tactics of irregular warfare, which which the revisionists are then going to use during and after the war against the British. But the political logic, of course, is – the British are the ones who won't let Jews settle in Palestine. And so if you can get the British out, then perhaps there will be some kind of state of Israel. And Polish, and Polish diplomats at the same time are also very clear that they want a state of Israel, and they want a state of Israel with the largest possible boundaries. They're thinking of their own needs or what they think are their own needs. They're thinking of their own problems or what they think of as their own problems. This is not all you know, this is by no means something which is um, altruistic vis-a-vis vis- vis- the Jews. But it is a very interesting chapter of history because, as you say, it's part of the political experience of some of the men who will then play a very important role in the creation and the government of the state of Israel. The Poles, Warsaw, knew what Hitler planned because Goering told them. In January 35, he's on a hunting trip with Polish officials, and he says that he wants a German-Polish invasion of the Soviet state. He wants Poland to help get rid of Get rid of the Soviet state, and Poland's reward will be the Ukraine. He tells them this. And Pilsudski listens, and then he dies, and his successors listen. And again, in 1937, Hitler asks Poland to join with Japan and the anti comintern Pact. Italy will eventually join it, and Poland turns him down. Poland understands that Hitler's building a, a, a plan to conquer the Russian state. And just quickly here, because we're going to turn to the destroying of states, Professor, did the Polish government think Hitler was uh, ready to do this? Did they think he was overambitious when he asked them to join with the conquest? If you read their intelligence reports, which I've done, they think it's a terrible idea. Hmm. They don't understand what the Germans... They don't understand how the Germans are going to govern the Soviet Union. They consider this in their own internal intelligence at great length. They don't understand how the Germans are going to interact with the Soviet population, how they could govern, how the Germans could govern over the long run. They don't appreciate just how savage Nazi ideology is. The Germans don't mean to govern. They mean to go in and starve and, and enslave. But they basically think that the Germans, the German plan doesn't make any sense, and they don't want to be drawn into it. That said, they also have no interest in telling the Germans something that direct. And so basically they're buying time for as long as they can by humoring the Germans about all this the, until they're forced to, to, to show their hand in 1939. We're coming to that, that in just a moment. We have to move through the conquering of states. Black Earth, the Holocaust, Holocaust is history and warning. Timothy Snyder is the author. I'm John Batchelor.